Thanks, Priscilla, and, and thanks, George and, and Esper, for inviting me to Brazil. It's great to be here, and uh, I will not even try to say anything in Portuguese. It's hard enough for me to spell something. I misspelled it right there. I'm, I'm sorry. Or did I? No, I didn't. I got it right. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, about lymphocyte trafficking and lymphocyte trafficking and perturbations in lymphocyte traffic trafficking are important in the pathogenesis of untreated infection and the question that I'm going to also ask is whether or not by interfering with lymphocyte trafficking during treated infection can we have any impact on persistence of HIV. So abnormal trafficking during untreated infection Normalization of trafficking during treated infection, can we interfere with that normalization and have impact on HIV persistence? But before I do that, I'm going to show you the real Balto. So yesterday, Rick Kalp showed you a statue of Balto, which is in Central Park in New York. But this is the real Balto, who lives in the Museum of Natural History in Cleveland. And so you might ask, why does an Alaskan sled dog live, if you call that living, in Cleveland, Ohio? Well, the reason is that after his successful leadership of the sled team to bring the antitoxin to the site of the epidemic, he and the rest of the dogs in the dog pack went on tour with a circus all over the United States. And apparently they were mistreated during this tour. They were hungry, they were unhappy, and they were living a miserable life. So children, this was noticed by some industrialist in Cleveland, and when he, back, when he came back to town, he organized a children's crusade where they would collect nickels and dimes to rescue Balto, and that's exactly what they did. They got enough money together, they rescued Balto, and the other dogs in the sled team brought them to Cleveland, where they lived out the rest of their lives in peaceful contentment. But when Balto died, he was stuffed and placed in the Museum of Natural History. So if you come to town, make sure you visit Balto, the real Balto, not the statue. Okay. You remember in the earlier days of the epidemic, and maybe even still today, generalized lymph node enlargement was a clinical finding in persons in the early days of AIDS. Now, do you, those of you who take care of patients, do you see as much lymph node enlargement now as you did in the old days? Is it the, do you still see it very often in people with untreated infection? Yes, no? We thought that in the middle of the epidemic, in the, in the early 90s, we weren't seeing nearly as much lymph node enlargement. Um, and so we asked ourselves whether or not this clinical observation was linked to any difference in pathogenesis, and we couldn't. This is another failed experiment. We did a lot of studies. We looked at the CD4 slope over time in people who had untreated viremia in the early days and in the late days, and the CD4 slopes were completely superimposable. But nonetheless, I still think that there has been less clinical, there is less clinical evidence of generalized lymphadenopathy than there was in the early 1980s. But in the, at any event, we were interested in trying to understand a little more about lymph node enlargement. Now, one of the things that normally takes place in the lymph node, which is an organ, it's in a very important immunologic organ, is that it has within it cells that are naive T lymphocytes, it has central memory T lymphocytes, and when antigen arrives in the periphery, it is brought into these nodes presented to those naive T cells where they can, where they can um, uh, mature into cells. Okay. 
All right, can you hear me? Good. All right, so they, they, after exposure to antigen, they mature into cells with a central memory phenotype, as well as to cells with an effector phenotype. And the cell, the effector cells are cells that we don't particularly want inside the lymph nodes because they are factories of sometimes perhaps of cytolytic molecules and certainly of inflammatory mediators. So we try to get those effector cells out onto the periphery where they can do their job and take care of the foreign antigens that are, that are invading. At the same time, we have remaining in the lymph nodes cells of a central memory phenotype such that if we see that antigen again, we can have a much more rapid and anamnestic T cell response, which is, uh, allows us to mount a faster immune response to that antigen if ever seen again. But in HIV disease, this, this relationship is, is altered, and multiple groups have shown that there is a retention of a variety of lymphocyte populations, including cells with an effector phenotype inside the lymph nodes in HIV disease, and this is likely responsible for the generalized lymphadenopathy that we saw. Now, one of the downstream outcomes of having these inflammatory cells persist in these lymph nodes is the elaboration of inflammatory mediators and as a regulatory response for this, the induction of factors such as TGF-beta that result in the formation of fibrous tissue. And Tim Shacker, who uh, uh, was here earlier, um, has shown us that there's fibrosis as a result of this, of all this collagen and, and, and fibrotic tissue that is shown here in blue. Now, this has some significance for immunologic restoration with suppression of viral replication. And numerous groups showed in the mid-90s with application of suppressive antiretroviral therapies, and this is a piece by Liz Connick that was from an ACTG study, that after application of antiviral drugs here at zero, there is a dramatic biphasic rise in numbers of circulating CD4 cells of both a memory and a naive phenotype. And then that rapid first phase rise is altered after about eight to 10 weeks and becomes a more uh, sustained but, but slower rise in circulating T cell numbers. So, losing again, there we go. What's responsible for this rapid first phase rise of circulating lymphocytes? Well, um, we thought that this likely represents a redistribution of retained cells from the lymphoid tissue because the pace of the rise was actually very substantial, very rapid, far too rapid, and more rapid that could be explained by increased proliferation and expansion of cells. So I'm changing gears just a little bit, but this will uh, we'll get you back to the issue of lymphocyte trafficking by looking at some data here generated by Nick Funderburg and a bit of a, of a while ago, where we looked at the effects of multiple T cell stimulation settings. Um, here are the first bar in each of these each of these uh, um, figures represents the unstimulated cells. These are cells stimulated through the T cell receptor, and then beyond that are cells stimulated by a variety of toll-like receptor ligands. Um, at the top, we have CD4 T cells. At the bottom, we have CD8 T cells. And on the y-axis here, we have cycling, and on the x-axis down here on the right, we have expression of a C-type lectin, CD69. What, what we can say uh, in terms of the activation outcomes of exposure to these microbial toll-like receptor ligands is that CD4 T cells, memory CD4 T cells enter cell cycle as reflected by expression of KI67. A somewhat different activation panel or activation phenotype is manifested by CD8 T cells when they're exposed to toll-like receptor ligands in that they express the C-type lectin CD69. So what does that mean? Well, um, I'll get to that in half a moment, 
And I'm going to get there by telling you a little bit about a bioactive lipid called sphingosine 1-phosphate. Sphingosine 1-phosphate is a lipid that's produced from the membrane of red blood cells. And levels of sphingosine 1-phosphate in serum and in lymph are very, very high. Yes, is this a better one? Oh, this is a great one. Okay, so um, there are multiple receptors for sphingosine 1-phosphate, but the one expressed by T cells is S1P1, sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor type 1. And this is a G protein coupled receptor. And what this receptor does is when ligated by S1P, it promotes chemotaxis. And this is thought to be a mechanism whereby cells that are inside lymph nodes exit from the lymph nodes into the circulation along a gradient of sphingosine 1-phosphate, which is low in the lymph nodes, high in the lymph, and high in circulation. So S1P1 expression is uh, uh, controlled in a variety of ways. One is via a uh, transcription factor called Krupa-like factor 2, which transactivates its promoter. And KLF2 levels decrease when T cells are activated as by a variety of stimuli, including stimulus by microbial products. But there's also post-translational regulation of S1P1 activity, um, and that is via CD69, which is why I showed you the CD69 data there, because what CD69 does is, is when it's expressed, it retains S1P1, the receptor, in the cytoplasm and does not let it get expressed on the surface of the T cell. So there's both transcriptional and post-transcriptional regulation of S1P1 expression and function. So our hypothesis was that the activated environment in the HIV-infected lymph node promoted sequestration of lymphocytes in those lymph nodes and the lymphadenopathy as a result of sequestration of T cells via downregulation of S1P1 expression and function. But the problem was we did not have a good method to evaluate S1P1 expression or function because the antibodies that were, had been generated to measure S1P1 did not detect surface S1P1 expression. So we went to the literature. And in the literature, you'll remember that King Babar, right? This is actually not Babar, this is his predecessor, the king of the elephants before King Babar, who died because he had eaten a poisoned mushroom. And this poisoned mushroom is Amanita phylloides. And one of the activities of phylloidin, toxin elaborated by Amanita phylloides, is binding to polymerized actin and paralyzing the cell. So, yeah, it's really sad. You know, Babar became the king because this guy's bad experience. We had to develop some assays to measure S1P1 activity, and we used two. First, in order to allow us to even measure S1P1 on the surface, we had to incubate the cells from blood, at least, in, in a, um, a serum-free medium because in the presence of serum, S1P binds S1P1 and promotes its internalization. So we did that in all instances. We stimulated these cells with sphingosine 1-phosphate, or as a control, SDF1-alpha, which binds to another G protein coupled receptor, receptor CXCR4. And our readouts included one, AKT phosphorylation as a result of G protein coupled signaling, and the other was actin polymerization, which we measured by using a fluorochrome labeled uh, phylloidin. And here are some of the data. The uh, top panel represents phospho-AKT in the x-axis. The bottom panel represents actin polymerization in the x-axis. The y-axis up top represents CD69. The y-axis on the bottom represents CD69. These are unstimulated cells. These are still stimulated with S1P. These are still stimulated with SDF1-alpha. And what you can see very clearly 
is that stimulation with SDF1 alpha results in the um, uh, phosphorylation of AKT by cells that are CD67, 69 negative and cells that are CD69 positive. Likewise, it results in actin polymerization, move, moving from here to here among cells that are CD69 negative and CD69 positive. So CD69 expression has no impact on CXCR4 ligation by its ligand SDF1 alpha. In contrast, if we look at stimulation by sphingosine 1-phosphate, we can show that the CD69 negative cells will um, um, phosphorylate AKT, but will not, that will not happen in the CD69 positives, and likewise, um, stimulation with S1P will result in polymerization of actin, moving from here to here, but will have no impact on the CD69 positive cells. So now we had some bioassays that allowed us to measure S1P1 function. So we looked at cells obtained from the lymph nodes of patients with HIV untreated infection, shown here in, whoops, shown here in blue, HIV negative individuals in red, and then a handful of people who had undergone treatment and control of viremia uh, who are shown in green. And what you can see is that among the CD69 positive cells, nobody has much actin phosphorylation either in the CD4 population or in the CD8 population. And likewise, not much actin polymerization among the CD69 positive cells as we expected. But even among the cells that were CD69 negative, among the untreated patients, there was a decrease in phosphorylated AKT among the CD4s and among the CD8s, and decreases in actin polymerization among the CD4s as well as the CD8s. And this improved substantially with treatment of HIV infection. So um, what we concluded from these data, uh, and these were published uh, five years ago, is that in the HIV-infected lymph node, the key receptor for the sphingosine 1-phosphate interactions, which is S1P1, is downregulated, at least in terms of functional activity, in part by CD69 binding and intracytoplasmic sequestration. And in these nodes, in both CD69 positive and CD69 negative cells, the function of S1P1 is diminished. And when we control HIV replication with antiviral therapy, S1P1 expression improves and lymphocytes are allowed to traffic into the vascular space that we think is results in the first phase cellular restoration, which is redistribution. So lymphocyte recirculation is restored with suppression of HIV replication. But is this good for control of HIV? And does this promote HIV persistence by allowing effector cells to move out of the lymph nodes and into the circulation where we generally want them? It segregates them, moves them into a compartment where they don't have access to a major site of HIV replication or persistence. So inside lymphoid tissues, we recognize them as an important site of HIV persistence. These lymphoid tissues are infected in early, rapidly in early infection, and in, in, uh, in the setting of antiretroviral therapy, a residual level of virus is demonstrable inside these lymphoid tissues, and these can be a major part of the latent reservoir. As Tim Shacker showed you yesterday, penetration of antiviral drugs into these sites is impaired. And so the question that Mirko Pajardini, who is sitting in the one, two, third, fourth row, uh, wanted to know is whether or not we could get effector cells back into the site, into the lymph nodes, during antiretroviral therapy with the idea that as if we could put effector cells into lymph nodes, move them out of the circulation into the lymph nodes, would this have any impact on HIV persistence? So the strategy that we, tr we applied was administration of a drug called fingolimid. Fingolimid is a, or FTY720, is an analog of sphingosine 1-phosphate and which gets phosphorylated in vivo and binds to S1P1, resulting in its internalization 
and by internalizing S1P1, it keeps lymphocytes in tissue sites like lymph nodes and prohibits, blocks them from getting out into the circulation, almost in some ways generating a syndrome like the syndrome of, HIV, of lymphocyte sequestration that is seen in untreated HIV infection. So, in these experiments that, that were done by Mirko and his team, that I'm taking credit for, um, the idea was to explore the therapeutic potential of FTY720 in art-suppressed SIV-infected rhesus macaques to see if it was safe and tolerable, and we chose two doses. One, a dose of 18 micrograms per kilogram per day, which is similar to the dose that is given to humans in well, I didn't tell you, and I should have, that the really nice thing about this drug, FTY720, is that it is FDA approved for the treatment of multiple sclerosis. And it is, works in multiple sclerosis by keeping, largely it's thought, by keeping activated effector lymphocytes in the lymph nodes and keeping them out of the circulation so that they cannot migrate into the central nervous system and cause disease. So this dose, 18 micrograms per kilogram per day, is similar to the dose that is FDA approved for the treatment of MS, and a dose of 500 micrograms per kilogram per day, which is a dose of this drug that has been tolerated in earlier animal studies. So the second goal was to see what the effect of FTY720 was on the numbers of lymphocytes in circulation and in lymphoid tissues. And the third aim was to ask whether or not there was any impact of this treatment on indices of SIV persistence. The strategy was to infect animals, and there were 10 animals that were in this, in this, in this study. They were infected with um, SIV-MAC-239, and they were kept infected for seven weeks, is that right, six weeks? And then they were started on antiviral therapy, which was a combination of tenofovir, FTC, and dolutegravir given parenterally. After about seven months, they were then exposed to 28 days worth of FTY720, and then they were necropsied at, at the end of those 28 days. Blood was obtained at multiple time points, and lymph nodes were obtained um, at several time points throughout the study. First point is that in the low-dose group and in the high-dose group, the administration of antiviral therapy was effective and decreased viral replication. There were a couple of blips in two animals during FTY721 in each of these groups that you can see over here. And what some safety labs were obtained in the two groups, group one is the low dose group, group two is the high dose group. In every one of these panels, the pre-dosing of FTY720 is shown in black, and the after-dosing of FTY720 is shown in blue. And there was really no impact on red cells, hemoglobin, blood urea nitrogen, which is an index of kidney function, creatinine, another index of kidney function, or on weight. So the stuff seemed to be well tolerated by the animals. What was quite apparent, however, was that very rapidly uh, with administration of FTY720 in each of the groups, group one here, group two here, within seven days, there was a dramatic decrease in numbers of circulating T cells that continued to go down in the low dose group, and this decrease in circulating T cells was even more apparent in the high dose group. This was reflected both in CD4 lymphopenia, in the two low and high dose group, and a less effective impact on CD8 T cell numbers in the low dose and in the high dose group. But at, week, at day 28 of therapy, uh, in the high dose group, the CD8 depletion was quite dramatic. Uh, lymphocyte subpopulations were measured using the, uh, the, uh, the, the dot plots above, and the cells were defined as effector memory cells, central memory cells, naive cells, and effector T cells by expression of CCD95, 
CCR and CCR7 and CD28. Uh, in black are the pretreatment numbers of naive T cells, central memory cells, and effector memory cells, and effector cells in the low dose group on the left and in the high dose group is on the right. And what you can see post FTY720 in both low and high dose groups, dramatic decreases in all cell populations um, by after exposure of FTY720. The cells were examined as well in circulation for transcription factors that, that is associated with cytolytic cell function as well as expression of cytolytic potential molecules, perforin and granzyme, and the numbers of CD8, CD4 and CD8 T cells expressing both the T, the transcription factor T-bet, perforin and granzyme were diminished in both groups in circulation uh, after FTY 720 administration. Now, one of the interesting things that came out from this study was that the proportional representation of cells in cell cycle, as detected by expression of the nuclear antigen KI67, went up dramatically with administration of FTY 720. So here, uh, are on these, on these uh, dot plots, we have the expression of KI67 on the x-axis, and the proportional representation went up in these particular plots, and we see here the percentage of all CD4 and CD8 T cells at baseline, and at day 7, day 14, day 21, and day 28 of treatment with FTY720, these represent the high dose group in the CD4 population and the CD8 population. So somehow, um, KI6, somehow cycling, proportional representation of cycling cells in circulation went up. Uh, Kostas Petrovas at NIAID did these really nice um, histocytograms uh, looking at uh, expression of CD3 in red. For T cells, CD20 in green identifying follicles and KI67, the same cell cycle antigen, in two animals, one and two, pre-treatment and post-treatment. And what you can see in these, in these uh, um, figures or in these, in these photographs is an apparent increase in the number, amount of redness post-treatment in both of these images as a consequence of FTY720 administration. And when quantified, and again, these quantification methods are a little complicated, it looks as though the number of T cells inside these lymph nodes uh, tended to increase um, as a result of FTY720 administration. Was there any impact on viral expression? Well, uh, we looked in several populations and in one population, and those are cells with a phenotype of T follicular helper cells, shown here by expression of PD-1 and CD-200. In both the low and the high dose group, the numbers of uh, uh, DNA copies per million T follicular helper cells looked as though it was diminished in the high dose group after treatment with FTY720. So, um, for this part of the story, it looks as though administration of this S1P inhibitor, S1P1 inhibitor, FTY720, is safe and well tolerated, well tolerated in art treated SIV infected rhesus, clearly reduces the numbers of circulating T cells, both CD4 and CD8, in these animals reduces the circulating numbers of all T cell subsets, including T cell subsets that have the potential of having cytolytic activity, induces a relative increase in the frequencies of cycling T cells in the blood of our treated SIV infected rhesus, increases T cell re retention in lymph nodes, and looks to reduce the SIV DNA content in T follicular helper cells inside lymph nodes. So uh, another study has been uh, started, 
and includes a longer duration of antiretroviral therapy to more closely resemble what we see in chronic HIV infection, as well as a longer duration of FTY720 treatment with the idea that longer exposure to effector cells retained inside the lymph nodes may allow greater control of SIV persistence or a greater effect on SIV persistence. Uh, the groups will include um, both a control population, which we didn't use in this initial study. Um, each animal was its own control. And FTY720 will be given at two different time points. One late, oops, sorry, late in, in, the, in the antiretroviral therapy regimen, similar to what we did here, but another initiation of FTY720 early after initiation of antiviral therapy with the idea that the numbers of HSIV-specific CTLs are going to be higher early on in antiretroviral therapy than after chronic therapy. And we're also thinking about ways whereby we can boost the cytolytic potential or perhaps target the homing of lymphocytes into certain regions of the, of the lymph node by those retained T cells. So as I said before, the, this animal work was all done by Mirko Pajardini in his lab, mostly by Sarah Paganini and Maria Pinoclaveria. Um, and a number of other people were involved in this work. J.C. Mudd, when he was a grad student in my lab at Case, did the first lymph node studies that I, that I, I mentioned to you. Um, Claire Delege and Jake are doing uh, some of the uh, um, measurements inside these lymphoid tissues, as was Kostas Petrovas, and these are folks at CASE who were part of these studies, and uh, I've got, can answer questions now. Thank you. I'm not, uh, sorry, I'm not sure if you demonstrated um, that there was actual migration of previously circulating cells into the lymph node. We can't show that, right. or at least we were unable to demonstrate this. What we were able to show is that the numbers of cells in circulation was diminished, and, and again, recognizing that quantitation of T cell numbers inside lymphoid tissues is difficult, it looked as though the numbers were increased. Now, remember that only 2% of the total body lymphocyte population is, blood, is in blood, and so the impact per node, the effect of redistribution of those cells per node is going to be pretty modest. But I, it looked as though there was a retention of, of, these, of these cells. Well, you highlighting that small contribution of blood actually probably answers the next question, because it's possible to imagine that trafficking CD4s into the lymph nodes might actually kind of end up being a bad thing. Yes, that's right. It might be a bad thing, and it seems to be a bad thing in the setting of untreated infection. Um, where this is probably responsible for the ongoing inflammation and uh, fibrosis, as well as some impairment in uh, immune recognition. And so um, this, this could be a bad thing in the setting of even a treated infection. More questions? Okay, thank you.